Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G, and welcome to Health 360 with Dr. G. Today's topic, getting to the heart of AFib. Many of us have heard about the heart condition called atrial fibrillation, or AFib for short, but how many of us really know about AFib? AFib is a common heart rhythm disorder that affects millions of people in the United States. Many of us may personally know someone with AFib, whether it be a spouse, a parent, a grandparent, or even a friend. To quote the late U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. C. Everett Koop, healthcare is vital to all of us some of the time, but public health is vital to all of us all of the time. So too does this apply to AFib, which has broad public health implications and associated economic impact, even with major advances in its management. When it comes to getting to the heart of AFib, we must continue to educate our communities on this condition because AFib may eventually affect you too. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez, board certified internal medicine physician, practicing out of Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Check out my website, health360podcast.com and follow me across all social media at health360wdrg. We have a great topic today, but before we get into it, let me hit you with a, with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast is for your information, entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So we're talking all things atrial fibrillation today. So I got everything, y'all. I want you to do this as usual. I want you to grab a pen. And I like this pen that says health360podcast.com. Grab a piece of paper, write things down. Remember, at the end of the day, I want you and my, my expert panelists, my physicians, my colleagues, my, my, my community, we want you to live the best and healthy, healthiest possible lifestyle that you can. And we want you to have all the resources to be successful with everything you do. Again, no question is off limits when it comes to your health. Let's make our health a priority. So we're gonna get right into it. I wanna introduce my amazing guests. We got a lot to cover today. Again, we're gonna have a lot of fun today. All things atrial fibrillation. Let me introduce you to my amazing guest, Dr. Apoor Gami, MD. He's a board certified cardiac electrophysiologist with Midwest Cardiovascular Institute. Dr. Gami, my friend, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Mark. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, that's a fantastic introduction to the topic, and uh, I'm really looking forward to touching on that and a lot of the details and nitty gritty. Uh, I love it, my friend. Thank you. I love it, my friend. Let's give it a Zeus. Every comic book hero has an origin story, my friend. I love it. Uh, why not? Uh, give us your story. Where did you go to? Uh, let's do a medical school, residency, fellowship. And after you do that, tell us a little bit why this topic of atrial fibrillation is so important to you, what you do on a daily basis. Sure. Okay. Well, thanks. So I am uh, a local guy. I grew up in the north side of Chicago uh, in the Burbs and uh, went to undergrad and med school at Northwestern. Uh, so uh, after that, uh, I convinced my uh, bride-to-be to, to travel to Minnesota with me. So we spent my uh, internship, residency, uh, cardiology fellowship, and then the uh, subspecialty fellowship in cardiac electrophysiology, which is the heart rhythm disorders, uh, up in Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic in uh, the city of Rochester. That was eight years of our lives, and our family was back in uh, Chicago, so we uh, we settled in Elmhurst and uh, have been there ever since. Uh, so now I've been practicing with a group of cardiologists uh, for the past uh, 14 years. Uh, we're uh, called Midwest Cardiovascular Institute. Uh, we're at Elmhurst Hospital, we're at Edward Hospital, uh, and uh, we, we take care of all forms of heart disease, peripheral, uh, vascular disease, uh, coronary heart disease, heart failure, uh, valve disease, and of course, uh, what you know, I've, I've focused my career on, which is heart rhythm disorders or electrophysiology, and we call it EP for short. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Gami. I can't wait to get granular with it as well, you too. So let's do it, y'all. So everybody grab a pen and paper. Here we go. We're getting right into it. So when somebody comes into our office, we call that the chief complaint. So here it is, the chief complaint, aka the situation of the hour. The question of the hour is, why is knowing about atrial fibrillation, AFib, important? So Dr. Gami, why don't we start by just, you know, we don't presume everybody knows anything about everything about atrial fibrillation. Let's start from the beginning, one-on-one. Can you just kind of, in your words, describe what is atrial fibrillation? 
Sure. I mean, that's really where it, it starts with any conversation with the patient uh, in, in the room for a consultation. So uh, atrial fibrillation is an electrical disorder of the heart. And everybody thinks, you know, of the heart as, as a pump. You know, it's a, it's a muscle. It pumps blood to the rest of your body. But something has to tell the heart to beat and to pump. And that is the integrated electrical system of the heart. Uh, nearly every uh, cell of the heart, the billions of cells that actually make up the heart, every single one uh, for the most part can conduct electricity, but it conducts electricity in a very standardized fashion. So uh, to understand AFib, you first need to understand what a normal rhythm looks like electrically. So if you think of a pond uh, out in the country, and if you kind of drop a pebble in the middle of the pond, you'll get this nice waves of uh, a ripple out from where you drop that, that pebble. And that, that's kind of how the electrical uh, signal starts for every single one of our heartbeats in the upper chambers of the heart, the atria. There's, there's a single spot that creates a heartbeat and that passes in a very organized and smooth and systematic way through both upper chambers, through both atria. And then there's a little highway of superelectricity called the AV node that then tells the lower chambers of the hearts, the ventricles, to pump. And then that's what actually creates our heartbeat. So if that's a normal rhythm, think of that same pond out in the country, but during a rainstorm, all right? Millions of raindrops falling in this pond, creating their own little drops, their own little eddies of, of, and ripples of water all crashing into each other at the same time, this chaotic rippling effect. And if that was electricity, that would be a fib. Atrial fibrillation is a chaotic storm of electricity in the upper chambers of the heart, in the atria. And if you were to measure how fast the heart was going during this chaotic activity, it might be somewhere upwards of 350, 400, 500 beats a minute fairly chaotic and irregular, no, no rhythm to it. Those fast and chaotic electrical beats will send signals down that super highway of electricity to the pumping chambers of the heart, the ventricles, in an erratic and irregular, but usually really fast way. And that's what makes people feel very fast heartbeats, what we call palpitations. That's what it means when you can feel your heart beating funny, palpitations. People feel these really fast palpitations and it beats irregularly, you know, not like a metronome in a song, nice and steady, but really just helter skelter. And uh, it feels very odd. Um, and because of that fast and irregular beating, people can feel really uh, short of breath. They can feel lightheaded or dizzy. Sometimes they get chest tightness or a sense of congestion. Um, and the interesting thing is that while some people feel all of that, there are other people that feel actually nothing at all. And that's what makes this rhythm, uh, and we'll talk about this more, uh, very important to screen for and try to find even if one is not having symptoms. So th that's kind of the basic electrical uh, uh, fundamental uh, mechanisms of AFib uh, in a picturesque sort of way. And we can kind of dive down into a little bit more specific oh, yeah. uh, technical stuff if you want to. First of all, Dr. Gavi, that was an amazing explanation of, of everything that's going on. I mean, the visual of that description of the pond, and it makes me want to hopefully have a peaceful pond and not a chaotic pond, as you described. Uh, but I just love that. And again, I can tell the passion of what we're talking about with AFib. Let me ask you this question, and, and, and I, just, I just love it. Uh, you know, I always say, you know, one thing on the side, you know, when we could say things to our patients, and they like, they're all of a sudden like, I get it. Boom. I mean, I mean, I mean, all the barriers are gone and you just have that person and you're there. That person is engaged. Don't right. you think so? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd say that a large portion of my consultations for people with atrial fibrillation, uh, the, the large part of what we talk about is what is AFib? Why does it make you feel the way you do? And, and once that understanding and education is done, uh, patients really understand why all these treatments are necessary or why they might help them. Uh, and I find a lot of time they come in to see me with that knowledge lacking. And so, you know, being told to take a medicine or being told to have a procedure or being told to change your lifestyle to, to fix a problem doesn't make any sense unless you understand why it might work. And, and that really goes back to understanding, you know, what's happening in the body. I love it, my friend. I like to use the, uh, uh, by the way, I'm totally barring your, um, totally barring your, um, your analogy with the pond. Great. I usually use an analogy with crazy school children in a room getting ready to go all over the place and the bell hasn't rung yet, but they're ready to run. <laughs> and the teacher's like, yeah, so everybody sit down. Come on, come on. Kids are running all over the place. So I, mean, I like that's that. How it is. I like that I one like too. too. Uh, yeah, it's craziness. But I love it, my friend. Let me ask you this question. Uh, do we know why? Do we know the cause? I mean, is, is it been truly established why these electrical pathways these, this, they become errant? Yeah, so, so that's where we dive down from this kind of picturesque analogy down to 
what's actually happening in those atria, in those upper chambers. So, so AFib is actually a, a continuum of a condition. There's a condition called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which means AFib comes and goes on its own without anyone doing anything to it. Um, then there's another condition called persistent atrial fibrillation, which means that the AFib sticks around unless a physician or you do something to your body to actually make it go away. And then there's a third condition called permanent atrial fibrillation, which means no matter what we do to try to make it go away, it just sticks around. And now the natural course of AFib is to begin as paroxysmal and gradually become persistent and then move on to permanent. Now with different lifestyle approaches, with different treatments, you can actually kind of abort or, or, or halt or even delay that natural progression. And one person with AFib might live as a paroxysmal type of a status you know, for their whole life and not progress. But that being said, getting down to the mechanisms of AFib uh, kind of speaks to these different types of AFib. So why, what's happening in the heart to make it beat chaotically? So for the paroxysmal patients where the AFib comes and goes, the, 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 what's happening in the heart are there are microscopic little cells that create a very, very rapid rhythm in those upper chambers. And, you know, maybe 200, 300 beats a minute, fast enough to, to create that erratic and chaotic rhythm that, that then, then stops on its own eventually. We found that those triggering beats um, start in, in an area of the heart called the pulmonary veins. These are veins that drain the oxygen-rich blood from the lungs back into the left upper chamber of the heart. The muscle fibers in there are very sensitive to lots of different things, stretch, ion channel abnormalities, and uh, when they trigger these beats, they happen very rapidly, and they cause AFib, which comes and goes as these triggering beats kind of quiet down over time. As time passes in one's life, and it may be due to some comorbidities, meaning other diseases that could affect the progression of AFib, which we're definitely going to talk about later. Yeah, no um, as time passes, the atrium itself changes. So it's not just these little triggering beats coming from these veins in the upper chambers, but now the whole structure of the atrium starts to change gradually over months and years so that fibrous tissue, scar tissue, different types of proteins get embedded in the muscle cells of the heart. And because of that, when these triggering beats cause AFib, they no longer stop. Now it just perpetuates in this abnormal muscles and tissues of the atrium, and that's why it becomes persistent. So while the triggering might stop, that abnormality in the left atrium itself and the tissue itself allows it to perpetuate and continue unless you do something to it to make it go away. So that's why it progresses from a paroxysmal nature to a persistent nature. There are these biological changes, mostly fibrotic, meaning scar tissue development in the upper chambers that lead to that. And sometimes those chambers get a little bigger because of that, that scar tissue developing. Love it, my so there, friend. there are conditions there that, that you know, we can develop as we age or associate yeah. with other types of heart disease that then cause those changes in the atrium that lead to people becoming more persistent or more permanent with, with their atrial fibrillation experience. Let's talk a little bit about some of those risk factors that are out there. And, and as you mentioned, you're talking about some of these changes. And I always think some of those structural heart right. abnormalities that can that can certainly perpetuate a situation. But if somebody's like saying, like, am I at risk for AFib? What are we looking for? Yeah. So I'd say about 10 to 20 percent of the people I take care of as an electrophysiologist are what we call lone afibers, meaning they don't have those risk factors, they don't have those other heart conditions, they strictly stay paroxysmal and it never really progresses because they don't have these other conditions. But the majority of people do have these things that lead to afib and this is kind of really what we're starting to understand as heart doctors, as electrophysiologists, to focus on more with patients is to try to prevent that progression yes. by addressing these risk factors. So th here's the conditions, these are the important conditions. Probably first and foremost, hypertension, so high blood pressure. This is you know, what they call the silent killer. Yep. You're not gonna usually feel bad with hypertension, but over decades, it persisting without being treated leads to a higher risk of stroke. And that's why we as you know, cardiologists and as internists, we really focus on trying to get blood pressures Controlled. within goal levels. But the other thing other than stroke that hypertension causes are these scarring and fibrotic changes within the upper chambers of the heart, the atria, enlargement of those, cha of, of those chambers and that thus leads to AFib. So, so hypertension is really, you know, epidemiologically in this country, probably the biggest risk factor for AFib. Other important ones is being overweight or being obese, um, even independent of it, those effects of, on high blood pressure, just in and of itself, probably has to do with the way that being overweight increases your blood volume and thus increases the chamber sizes in, in the heart. Um, also a condition called sleep apnea which is usually treated by neurologists and uh, lung doctors uh, or a dedicated sleep specialists. Sleep apnea is now recognized as a, uh, as a risk factor for AFib as well due to a number of different 
mechanisms that sleep apnea can cause within the heart. Um, aside from that, kind of more advanced heart diseases are, are definitely strong risk factors. So something called heart failure, which is where the lower chambers of the heart, the ventricles become weak and don't pump blood as strongly as they should. That weakness of the heart leads to pressure developing in the upper chambers of the heart, again, causing them to enlarge, causing scar tissue to develop and leading to AFib. Uh, and valve disease, different types of valve diseases like aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation. These are either narrowings or leakiness of the heart valves that lead to increased stress within the upper chambers of the heart. Whether it's a pressure stress or a volume of blood stress, that leads to that kind of progressive scarring and enlargement of the atria that lead to AFib also. I got you. So thanks for giving us some really good pointers there because you re it really is a saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And it's like, it's like if we're not getting those things under control, which, which of course society will say we, epidemiologically, we are something, you know, we're struggling now in the middle of the pandemic when people have put off their health care for such a long yeah. time. And now we're seeing untreated sleep apnea, which is already underdiagnosed in this country, rising coronary disease, hypertension at all time high because of things in the obesity epidemic. You know, we're seeing these challenges. And so it's yeah. like, how do you think we should just address that? I, I know part of it falls on, you know, I'm trying to get people to hopefully not have to, I mean, I, I love you and everything. I love how you take care of my patients, but I'm like, I'm trying to say, how can I get you from not having to see Dr. Gami uh, for something that may be preventable? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, cardiology and electrophysiology is a funny field in that we try really hard not to have repeat patients, right? Yeah. We're trying to, yeah. we're trying to reduce business. Uh, we want our patients. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's like, we try to reduce business. It's true though. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> that is, you know, that's one of the great things about our field is that when we're successful, we might have, we might have a patient who we actually don't see again through the course of their life. That's how successful we can be. Other times we might see them once every year or two years just for kind of monitoring and maintenance, but yeah. really they're not an active patient. They don't see themselves as patients. And that's, you know, in, in my practice, that's my goal. That's my goal is to see a healthy patient coming in. There's not much to talk about except how the kids and <laughs> the dogs doing because the treatment's been established, they're successful with it and, and they go on. So. But prevention is everything now. I think we're learning with AFib, all the treatments, and we'll talk about those, right? Antiarrhythmic drugs, ablation, things that really uh, patients have a lot of interest in learning about to control their symptoms of AFib. That's like a bandage on, on the real problem. You know, we're trying to now prevent uh, uh, symptoms of the really underlying conditions and the changes the hypertension caused, the heart failure caused, sleep apnea caused. So um, there are great studies that show what does actually prevent AFib. You know, they're, they're actually more and more studies as the years go on. People are very interested in this. Um, definitely controlling hypertension does. There's certain types of blood pressure medications that also have been proven to help prevent uh, AFib as well. Um, the, there aren't great trials of treating sleep apnea to show that you know uh, treating sleep apnea makes AFib go away or prevents it from happening. But um, large kind of observational data of physicians and communities of people around the world have shown that uh, treating sleep apnea does help prevent it as well. Um, exercise, hugely important. So there's there's this sweet spot for exercise and preventing AFib, and this is kind of an interesting yeah. nuance yeah. of AFib. So being sedentary, overweight, or obese definitely is a risk factor for AFib, independent of the, the relationship of being overweight with other heart conditions. Just in and of itself, it's a risk factor. As you become more active into a kind of a stage of light aerobic exercise, which means walking, jogging, bicycling, swimming, light aerobic exercise, you reduce your risk of AFib. As you start to increase the uh, intensity of your exercise, once you get to kind of endurance athleticism, triathletes, um, biathletes, um, you know, guys who are doing you know, marathons every year, these can, these types of athletes have been shown to have an increased risk of AFib. So it's paradoxical. These are it people who are taking really great care of themselves. They're gung-ho about uh, going above and beyond to stay athletic. And oftentimes, uh, they come in with atrial fibrillation outside of any other type of heart disease. And, and there's a relationship to that kind of super athleticism, uh, endurance athleticism to to the biological changes in the upper chambers of the heart that can lead to AFib. And you know, we can dive into that yeah. later it's, if you it's want. It's, par it's paradoxical in the sense that everything we've always heard is that if you're good to your heart, be kind to your heart, if you do the right things, including physical activity, yeah. 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise as the recommendation. That's perfect. And, and, and it's perfect, but it's like, if we potentially go 
exceed that, yeah. you know, we're putting ourselves so, at right. risk. Right. And, and, and definitely don't want people, you know, people to come away from this thinking that this is their carte blanche and, you know, hey, that I, don't, true. I don't need exercise. exercise y'all. No, Everybody no. that's listening, <laughs> the doctor exercise. Said don't exercise. Don't. So, no. yeah, he, did, so, he didn't say that. He said exercise. No. Yeah, no. Light know. to moderate, light to moderate aerobic exercise, 100%. Mm-hmm is preventative for all types of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, um, helps improve aerobic capacity and heart failure, and prevents AFib. That's been proven. Uh, it's when you get to the, uh, the, the um, really high elite type of athletes, triathletes, um, marathon runners, yeah, as there there's an increased risk. These tend to be younger people without heart disease, and it's very frustrating for them because they really uh, had, had committed themselves to, to leading a very healthy life in, in, in performing these sports. That's a rare. That's a rare thing, and no one should really be uh, um, worried about performing kind of normal levels, moderate levels of, aer- of aerobic exercise to help prevent AFib and and all the other cardiac uh, conditions that we want to. Gotcha, Doctor Gavin. Let's get into a little bit of the treatment out there. Just generally speaking, you mentioned that obviously treatment could be maybe a combination of things like heart rhythm medications, uh, potentially uh, cardioversion. Uh, and let's 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 kind of do a quick little overview of maybe the meds that are out there, just kind of sure. meds one on one, and then maybe some of the next level stuff if we're not doing a medicine. Yeah, so so important uh, to start out with, you know, well, what are the what are the rationales for the treatment of AFib? There's there's three goals. Okay, the first goal is to prevent or control symptoms. Again, that's really a lot of what the patient comes in focused on, and yep. we spend a lot of time. And, and I'll dive into what the different treatments are to control symptoms. The second goal, which may be the most important one, and the one I usually start with when talking to patients, is protecting their brain. So atrial fibrillation is associated with a higher risk of having a stroke. These are what we call ischemic strokes, where clots form within the upper chambers of the heart and travel through the arteries, up into the brain arteries, and clog an artery, and lead to a stroke. Uh, And so one of the main goals of therapy is to prevent a stroke. And that usually, but not always, means beginning some form of a blood thinner to prevent clots, okay? And then the third goal for treating AFib is preventing heart failure. And heart failure is a term that means uh, weakened heart muscle. And uh, the way that we prevent heart failure in relationship to AFib is by controlling how fast the heartbeat goes in AFib. Yeah. People who develop heart failure in AFib are a very small group of people. But they're people who don't have symptoms of AFib and thus just have a rapid heartbeat from AFib for weeks and months on end before the end result of a weak heart is identified. And then we have to kind of work backwards, fix their heart, fix the AFib kind of in backwards form, right? Because they only got symptoms because the heart was weak. Their AFib was silent. So kind of flipping around to the front again. So yeah. symptomatic people, how do we treat them? Uh, there, there's kind of three, three paradigms. One is just control the heart rate, okay? So for some people, it's okay to stay in AFib for their whole life, decade after decade. It doesn't do generally a great bit of harm to, you know, their, their survival, their longevity, their day-to-day yep. life. Yep. Um, if you simply control how fast the heartbeat goes when they're in AFib, usually people can have no symptoms and lead a normal life. Okay, so that's called a rate control approach. The other paradigm is called a rhythm control approach. So there's some people who just don't feel good in AFib, even if their heart rate is perfectly controlled. All right. And sometimes it's very difficult to get a fine balance of the heart rate where it doesn't go too fast and too slow. The same medicine might kind of, you know, compete with these interests of a fast heart rate and a slow heart rate. So we have to move on to actually get rid of the AFib itself and get back to a normal rhythm. And that's called a rhythm control approach. Uh, most patients prefer a rhythm control approach. They like feeling that they're, you know, so-called normal. They oh, want their rhythm yeah, to be yeah. normal. <laughs> um, and the, the ways that we do that are, one, a, a class of drugs called antiarrhythmic drugs. So there's about, about six drugs that have been designed and FDA approved specifically for treating AFib. The way that they work is, is acting throughout the body on different ion channels, so sodium channels, potassium channels, um, different receptors called beta receptors. These are things that lead to those triggering beats and lead to those erratic and chaotic rhythms in the upper chambers of the heart. And the medicine, which you usually take you know, once a day or twice a day, kind of just puts a blanket on. It's kind of like smothering a fire. You're just kind of just blanketing all this chaotic electrical activity and just smothering it and quieting it down. And by doing that, you can allow the normal rhythm of the heart to kind of pop in and do what it's supposed to do without these triggering beats and this chaotic electrical activity from happening. So 
Antiarrhythmic drugs can be pretty successful. You know, when you take all six, the range of success is somewhere between 40 and 80 percent, depending on which drug you use and different drugs for different people based on what other types of heart conditions or, or medical conditions they have that would make them a candidate for one or another. Um, they do require some monitoring. You got to have an EKG yeah. every few months. You need some blood work every few months. But overall, fairly well tolerated and fairly safe. Um, so then outside of antiarrhythmic drugs for controlling the rhythm, the other option is something called an ablation. So an ablation is a procedure that I do or, or another electrophysiologist would do. Yeah. Um, what we do is take people into our heart catheterization lab in the hospital. Uh, they're uh, anesthetized either with conscious sedation or general anesthesia. And then we put wires up from their leg veins, the femoral veins, all the way up into their heart under x-ray guidance. While we're in there, we then find the triggering spots for their atrial fibrillation, right? Those pulmonary veins that create those fast beats, those scarred areas of the left atrium or the upper chamber of the heart that perpetuate the AFib. We map out the heart electrically, we find those areas, yes. and then we do what's called ablation. So with these thin little wires, they're kind of like flexible like spaghetti noodle sized wires, we can cauterize the heart, actually deliver a little electrical energy that cauterizes the tissue in a very strategic pattern to make the AFib go away. Um, since 2011, uh, we've done something called cryo balloon ablation. So now we're not cauterizing the heart in these strategic ways. We're actually freezing the heart tissue using a specialized balloon that, that freezes the uh, an anatomy of the heart that creates those triggering beats, the pulmonary veins. We were at Elmhurst, we were the first to do that in 2011 in, in the states all around us. And it right now around the country, you know, is, is along with the radio frequency ablation, the cautery ablation that I mentioned is the, the main modality for uh, a, awesome. a, a fib. We also use laser, we use other techniques as well, and research is just wild in how to ablate a fib. Um, it's just a burgeoning field to understand you know, how you balance success rates with the potential risks of putting catheters in the heart and burning or freezing, which you know can have about a one to 3% rate of serious complications. So there's always that balance of benefits and risks that we're trying to weigh with patients, determining you know what their goals are, you know, whether they want to take medicines, whether they want kind of a one-time shot with a procedure, what their tolerance for risk is, what their tolerance for monitoring drugs long-term are. You know, we really feel them out for, for their, their personal preferences. And, yeah. and that usually is what helps make the determination of what we do. This is a very patient-centered field, taking care of AFib. There usually is no right answer, you know. Mm -hmm. Some patients come in wanting to know, Doc, what should I do? <laughs> Just tell me. And, and I... You know, I'm not great with that conversation. I'm, yeah, I'm happy I mean, they're mine. <laughs> you know, I'm happy telling them what I think in their yeah. situation might be best, but I really spend time getting to know them. You know, even in one visit, you can really get to know people's preferences, how they feel about drugs versus procedures, their risk tolerance, and then kind of lay out, in my perspective, what, what they might want best, you know, rather than what I want. All right, my friend. Yes, you definitely hit the head on that. It can't be a one size fits all. It's got to be personalized. But that's how okay. medicine has to be. Let's do another, something here. Uh, first of all, thank you for breaking all that stuff down, Dr. Gum. I love it. You know, when we think about, you know, AFib as being a common condition, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions certainly that are out there about it. So I've compiled a list of frequently asked questions, my friend. So here okay. we go. We're going right. to do these things. We're going to see how many of these we can get through. I love there's it. Here rapid, we go. Rapid fire here. I know, rapid fire, my friend. I okay. love rapid fire sections. And again, everybody, you're joining us here on Health 360 with Dr. G. You know what, Dr. Gummy, I got one other surprise for you. I got a little bit of a joke uh, uh, to, before we lead into this section, but here, here's a joke. All right. Well, it's, it's, and I'm not really good at telling jokes, and you can ask anybody I know. I'm rather corny on my jokes, but here it is. Here's my AFib joke of the day. Uh, here's a statement. Well, it's a joke, but here it is. I don't like lying, but my heart keeps AFibbing. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's horrible. I know. It's horrible. I know. I know. Oh, so, man. Yeah, I, it's yeah. bad. And I'll, I'll, I'm, not, I'll, I'm not sure I'm going to use that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't get used to that one anywhere in public. Don't use it. Uh, and of course, I'll give you another one before we get to Mr. Spence. But let's run, run through some of these rapid fires. Here we go. Okay. Dr. Cummings, here's the first question. Frequently asked questions. All right. I have been diagnosed with AFib. Should I make changes to my diet? A great question. So I think the answer is yes. Um, if you've been diagnosed with AFib, you should really start to look at your lifestyle, and that includes your diet. Um, there, are, there are a few things I think that you could focus on if you have AFib. Number one is your caffeine intake. So caffeine is a, a trigger for atrial fibrillation. Uh, when we're in this electrophysiology lab where we do ablation, sometimes we try to make AFib happen to assess you know, how successful we were with what we did in the lab. And what we do sometimes is we infuse pure caffeine into the veins, and we try to trigger AFib that way. 
So caffeine is a trigger. And so, you know, one to two cups a day, I think, is a, a limit that you can keep and not really increase the risk of AFib too much. But beyond two servings of caffeine a day, um, I think one has one should limit that. And, and again, this is personalized. So if, if you're someone who drinks five or six cups of caffeine for whatever reason a day, <laughs> you're not having AFib, well, you know, at that point, it's yeah. okay. It's not going to cause AFib, but if you're someone who has AFib and you're dealing with recurrences that bother you, that would be one thing to, to cut back on. Alcohol is another thing. So, so alcohol is a known acute, meaning direct trigger for AFib. Biologically, that's what, that's what it can do. And on top of that, binge alcohol drinking can cause episodes of AFib. This has been really picturesquely shown kind of in some movies and stories and, and, yeah. and anecdotes of medicine. There's something called holiday heart. I don't know if... Uh, Mark, if, you, if you've heard of that with your patients, but basically these are patients who usually don't drink a lot of alcohol, then they have a party or it's yep. Christmas time or New Year's. That's what we call a holiday heart. They have maybe four or five, six more drinks than they usually do. They do fine that night. They go to sleep. And the next day, day. Yep. they have heart rates of 140, 160, 200, and they're in AFib. We call it holiday heart. It's usually 24 hours after a bit of binge alcohol use. I, I remember those it days. It stop on its own within a few <laughs> days, um, but it's, it's, it's definitely a pattern that people sometimes recognize. So definitely caffeine, binge alcohol, or excess, say, more than two drinks of alcohol a day has also been shown to uh, lead to AFib. And then the other one would be salt. So there is a certain salt, group yeah. of patients who, who are salt sensitive. Uh, in ways that it relates to high blood pressure. So for hypertensives who are salt sensitive, where having excess salt leads to uh, abrupt increases in their blood pressure or chronic elevations in their blood pressure, reducing salt intake uh, would be beneficial. So those okay. are the main things. Now, outside of that, trying to minimize weight gain, trying to maintain a healthy weight, whatever dietary choices you know you choose to do that will be important too for AFib because we know that being overweight uh, contributes to AFib incidents as well. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Let's go to this next one. And you just made me think of like, as you mentioned, like uh, the holiday heart. I remember some of those stories when, you know, you're a resident and I used to be at the VA and we'd see those cases that, you know, that 24 hours afterwards, I remember them yeah. uh, quite fondly. And then yeah. it also got me thinking about Folgers and, and, and Keurig, by the way, when you said sometimes you infuse caffeine. I know you're not pouring, I know you're not pouring Folgers in anybody. Don't let anybody get that wrong. Uh, <laughs> the Folgers makers are upset in their, at us right now. It's all good, but thank you. Here we go. Hey, That's one of my sponsors. friends. I know, they are, I know, it's awesome. <laughs> here we go, next one here. I like this one. Um, here's a statement, or frequently asked question, here we go. Statement followed by question. I heard that the risk of blood clots caused by AFib increases with certain conditions. What are they? Yeah, so that, that's a, a great observation. So, uh, and it's really important because that knowledge that there are, there's the baggage of AFib, the other conditions yeah. that can come along with AFib are truly what increase the risk of stroke in patients who have AFib. And so we use those other conditions as markers for an individual person to help them understand you know, how high is their risk of stroke yes. and whether they should take a blood thinner or not. Remember, I said not everyone needs to take a blood thinner, but people whose risk of stroke is high enough should take a blood thinner, you know, as long as they don't have a reason not to, like a bleeding problem or something like that. So the conditions to keep in mind are hypertension, yeah. okay, um, some heart failure or a weak heart muscle, Importantly, diabetes. Yes. Okay, so this is not a heart condition, but it's a it's a systemic and metabolic condition that increases the risk of stroke in people with AFib. Um, and then, you know, a prior history of having a mini stroke called a TIA or a stroke. Uh, those are the main uh, conditions that, that we carry along. You know, in Western society, pretty uh, pretty high prevalence that increase the risk of stroke if you have AFib. There's some rarer things like something called mitral valve stenosis, a narrowing of the mitral valve, or a, a abruptly high thyroid state. So people who have inflammation of the thyroid gland and something called thyroiditis or hyperthyroidism, they also have an increased risk of stroke, but that's a bit uh, less common. All right, here we go, I like this one. Here's one for my techies out there. Uh, here's a frequent last question. Will my wearable watch detect AFib? <laughs> it, well, here's here's the thing. It yeah. might. It might. Okay. <laughs> right? That's what I've told it, people. It might, it, might, yeah. it might also detect a lot of things that are normal and call it AFib. Okay. Uh -huh. so, we're, we're, yeah. Yeah. so we're learning a lot of, about wearables. Um, there's so many different forms. There's so many different technologies and brands. Um, you know, the chest wearables, the wrist wearables. There's cuffs, of course, on the arm. Uh, there's even finger ones. There's now I just saw one where uh, you can wear what looks like a ring. Oh, come on. Right assess your heart rate <laughs> Technology, gotta love yeah. it, but sometimes gotta so, so hate it. So all of these are pretty good. 
yeah. at picking up AFib, what they're really looking at is irregularity in your heartbeat. So it's not looking truly at you know what the electrical rhythm is, but it's just looking at the the, the frequency of kind of irregular beats. Um, how unsteady is the beat? And if it's enough, if it meets that particular proprietary device's algorithm for saying it's AFib, it'll ding you as having AFib. Now, so I think these tools are great for people who have some risks for developing AFib. Okay, that's where they become helpful. Is if you already have a few risk factors piled up for developing AFib, using some sort of a surveillance monitor like that. I think might be helpful. Um, mm -hmm. If you have no risk factors for AFib, if you're if you're a healthy person, um, I think wearing something like that may cause more concern and and anxiety than uh, than it actually helps because it will come up with what we call false positives. It'll come up with dings that are, are due to normal rhythms uh, or what we call artifact technical abnormalities mm -hmm. of the device, not true biological rhythms. So it can lead to you know worried what we call the worried well. You know people mm -hmm. who are just well but now they're worried about their health when they shouldn't be. So Helpful when you have risk factors or helpful if you're being treated for AFib and kind of want to monitor whether the treatment is successful. I think it's helpful there. All right, here we go. I like this next one. Here we go. Uh, does atrial fibrillation run in families? Great question. So it does. It does run in families. There are known um, gene abnormalities that, that code for different proteins that create ion channels in the heart. So potassium channels, sodium channels, uh, calcium channels, different uh, gene mutations that code those different proteins in our body that have been shown to associate with a familial risk of AFib. Now, it doesn't mean that people who are 70 and 80 year olds and getting AFib uh, uh, have it because their parents or their grandparents have. No, these, these people are usually in their teens yes. and early to mid 20s. Uh, right. And they don't have any other type of heart disease and they purely have these ion channel abnormalities. Uh, and so while it is genetic in a, in a much, much smaller, rare group of people, it's really these other factors that we've already talked about that lead to AFib for most people. Excellent. I like this one. This is a, a random random question. So here it is. Can can tarantula spider venom treat AFib? <laughs> that was a random question that I was, I was like, uh, that's random. Uh, that I is, don't know what I'm doing with venom of anything, <laughs> in all honesty. So I love it. Here. So well, that brings up a few things. So one yeah. is um, well, if you if if you do treat it with that, it, you probably won't live to find out, right? Yeah. So yeah, so so not great. Not. Idea. But, but here's the deal: there are lots of other things that people do that aren't you know FDA approved medicines that they that they learn about through different means that are you know so called healthy or uh, for them. And and one of these are blood thinners. People have a lot of their own thoughts about blood thinners, yeah. different uh, non FDA approved or non really you know randomized controlled trial studied treatments that they believe in. And they'll come in and talk to me about, well, hey, instead of using this drug or this drug to thin my blood, can I use this over-the-counter thing from, you know, uh, the, the pharmacy or from a health food store? Uh, I read about it and, and it's promoted by some guru or something. And, you know, I, I don't yeah. have a strong uh, opinion about things that I don't fully understand. So I usually tell them, you know, give me what you've come up with. I'll read it. I'll read it. I'll give you my, my, my thoughts. But, but when it comes down to things that have harm, you know, then I kind of stand pretty firm in, in what has been studied carefully. Yeah. And so when it comes to AFib, these medicines, you know, that cause electrical changes in the heart or that change the proteins of the blood to thin it, they need to be um, taken with care. You know, you can thin the blood too much and have problems, or you might not thin the blood enough and not really prevent strokes. So it's best to use things, I think, that have been studied rigorously in the way that we understand in medicine scientifically in randomized controlled trials of tens of thousands of people around the world. That's kind of how we gauge the success of these things. But um, I definitely uh, respect people's you know, opinions about what they're bringing in, but really try to you know, focus them on, on answers I can give them, which come there from, from studies that we've, that we've you know, looked at. We got your brother. Here we go. I like this last one. Uh, we'll do one more of these, then we'll get into some misverses facts, but I like this one. Here we go. Uh, just kind of set the record straight. This is more just kind of a, actually, I want to do two more of these. Here we go. I like this one. We'll do this one first. Here's a, here's a freaking nice question. Are women more likely than men to have AFib? Ah, okay. Good question. Yeah. So based on, you know, the most recent population-based studies that I've looked at, and I think the, mo the most recent one was one published in Journal of American Medical Association in uh, 2001. So, you know, it's not in you know, the past 20 years, yeah. but looking at so. uh, data from the many decades before that, it's, it's kind of a wash. You know, if there is an increase in men or women, it's, it's not by much. The comorbidities, you know, the different medical That's conditions that we talked about, is tend to frequent men more than women. And so I think men have a little higher risk because they carry these conditions. 
more. Um, but the, the, then the paradox in, in men and women in AFib is that while men may have a slightly higher prevalence or, or rate of having AFib, women actually have a higher risk of stroke related to AFib, all right? So that's an important kind of risk factor that, uh, that we take into account when deciding whether to use blood thinners to prevent stroke or not. If you're a woman, compared to a man the same age, you do have a higher risk of having a stroke with AFib. Thank you. You know, it's interesting. I always it made me think of something where, you know, as we're seeing more people survive, you know, they're living, they're surviving their, their MIs, they're surviving their, their open heart surgeries, they are surviving longer with heart failure management. Um, that just, to me, just says, oh my gosh, I feel like we're going to see AFib much more. Yeah. And that's going to lead to more yeah. economic impact and burden. No and things so 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 how do we maybe maybe here's the question for you how do we um, how do we try to reverse course yeah so just speaking to those numbers yeah. you know it's not just a feel right so we kind of know what to expect so right now there's somewhere between four and six million people in uh in the u.s with afib okay by 2050 so in just 30 years that number is going to be somewhere around 10 million so essentially right? doubling the number it's going to double yeah, in yeah. 30 years, and that's just purely based on the aging population. Mm -hmm. People are living longer, and they're living longer with the same conditions that I listed before that cause AFib, yeah, hypertension, yeah. heart failure, yeah. diabetes, being overweight, all of these things. So AFib is basically a burgeoning epidemic, right? It's just going to be around us. You're going to know somebody with AFib, yeah. right? There's no doubt about it. So with that, um, that's where we see the field of electrophysiology looking back at the origins of AFib more and more, right? We can't just ablate what's out there already. We can't just, you know, smother it with antiarrhythmic drugs. These will help the people who have AFib now, there's no doubt, and they're really effective at doing so, and people are going to live full lives and really be happy with those treatments. But we, we as electrophysiologists, cardiologists, interns, need to really focus uh, on those risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, overweight, obese status, um, sleep apnea, yeah, those are the efficient. things that we really need to focus on through young adult life and middle age to prevent that epidemic from happening. It's definitely a reversible epidemic, right? Um, it's just a matter of how much uh, effort we as a society put into focusing on those those precursors yep. to disease rather than just treating the end results. Well, this is why this is why we're having this conversation today. We probably can't let this conversation just die. We got to keep this going on. It's got to be part of that everyday vernacular. Love it. Let's get into a section that we do each week on Health 360 with Dr. G called Miss versus Facts, setting the record straight. So we're going to go through some more rapid fire right. stuff. Um, and I'm going to say the statement and Dr. Gum is going to say myth or fact. And then give us like a, we're going to go kind of go boom, 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 okay. boom. We're going to see if we get through as many as, as you can. And you know what, everybody? I actually might participate. We'll see what happens. I don't know. Depends how I feel. But before I do that, Dr. Gami, let me hit you with another joke. Here it is. <laughs> um, and it's appropriate because you being a cardiologist, cardiology, electrophysiologist, here it is. Don't lie to a cardiologist. They can always spot a fib, a fib. Get it? Oh, it's horrible. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, I like it's, it. it's cringeworthy. I mean, it's I all like good. It. it is. It's all good. All right. Let's get into this. Here we go. Dr. Gummy, myth or fact? Please explain. We'll do it. We'll do We'll get through these kind of quick. All right. Here we go. Um, myth or fact? AFib may or may not cause symptoms. Myth or fact? Please explain. Fact. Yeah. Like we talked about, on a scale of zero to 10, some people may feel nothing at all. Other people might feel like they're falling off a cliff, can't breathe, have chest pain, are fainting. Uh, most people are somewhere, you know, in the kind of middle, uh, on a scale of zero to ten, maybe four or five. But yeah, you can go from anywhere on that on that spectrum. All right, here we go. I'll take this one because we already got the answer. I'll refresh it. Here it is. In most cases, people with AFib can still participate in physical activities by following the doctor's recommendations. Absolutely, we said earlier that activity is an important thing. There's that sweet spot, and what we kind of really say, moderate physical activity, something that'll just you can have a conversation. And that's why I say moderate physical you can have a conversation with somebody. If I'm walking next to you, we're walking, we can talk. We might yes. be a little breathing a little bit more, but that's it. It's riding a bike, you can have that conversation. But the answer Absolutely. is Absolutely. Yes. So yeah, fact, definitely fact. Uh, AFib should not, when, when it's well treated and, and we get to the goals of treatment that we want, AFib should not limit your physical activity. Love it, brother. Love and it. Many Here people go. come in scared. They don't want to, you know, they want to start exercise program. They don't want to advance their exercise program. Yeah. They should. They definitely should. The only limit to exercise when you have AFib is the symptoms it causes. Fair enough. Right? So Fair if you start exercising and start having those symptoms worsen with exercise, yeah. then you need to back off, pace yourself, and talk to your doctor about how to improve those symptoms so you can get back to doing the level of exercise that you want to do. 
Here we go. I like this one, Dr. Gummy. Here it is. Here's a statement, myth or fact. Your medicine is not working if you still get episodes of a fib. Ah, okay. So uh, myth. Okay. So that is so that that speaks to you know what are your goals for treatment. So some people before they see us and may have symptoms of AFib every day, multiple times of day, paroxysms that come and go, start and stop, you know very rapid rhythms that feel awful, and they might happen every day, every week, um, and and the treatment that we uh, you know work with them to to achieve might limit their symptoms to once every six months or once every nine months. Um, and so those treatments are successful. If you can reduce the burden, the overall frequency, the duration, the severity of symptoms down from something that dramatic to something that's really rare. So if someone does have a rare symptom after many months or even a year or more of therapy, we don't just you know, throw that treatment out you know, with the bathwater and say, let's start from scratch. We usually say, okay, it's one kind of what we call a breakthrough. Yeah. Let's you know stick with it, let or and let's see if there are more breakthroughs and we need to change the approach. So it's it's okay. You can have breakthroughs uh, and a treatment can still be successful as long as you kind of understand. Well, what are my goals with my AFib based on how I used to feel? Love it. Here we go. I like this one, Doctor Gummer. I'll give this one back to you on this one. Here it is. Uh, catheter ablation procedures can only be performed once. Myth or fact? That's a myth. Uh, patients who have AFib often uh, time will need a second ablation through the course of their life and sometimes even more than two. Uh, atrial fibrillation, so this is important to understand, atrial fibrillation is not a condition we necessarily cure, okay? So the word cure is, is kind of a taboo one when we're talking about atrial yes. fibrillation. We get a little wary if, you know, someone comes in saying that another doctor was going to cure them. It generally doesn't happen, okay? I can count maybe 20 patients in, you know, close to 15 years of people here in Elmhurst that have been taken mm -hmm. care of that are actually cured, really cured, meaning they're not on drugs, they've never yeah. needed a second ablation, uh, and they've never had AFib again, okay? So it's Fair a enough. really small number. Mostly AFib is controlled or palliated, uh, and, and the, those things that we talked about biologically that allow AFib to occur, they're still in the heart, right? They're still happening, and so uh, we need to address them, you know, over time if they, if they happen again which is why the prevention aspect is so important because you can control those underlying uh, mechanisms by, by uh, you know, those lifestyle changes. We Excellent. About. We'll do this one. I'll, I'll take this one. I'll give this a stab. Here we go. Okay. This is for Dr. G. Uh, a one size fits all approach for the treatment of AFib simply does not work. And that is a fact. I say managing AFib uh, successfully requires ongoing treatments, consultation with your electrophysiologist, but it cannot be a one size fits all. There's many assessors that have to happen during management, labs, other kind of testing, it cannot be a one size fits all. What do you say, Dr. Gami, to that? Yeah, absolutely true. Uh, you know, people who come in with an idea that, well, this is what my cousin had and this is what I want, <laughs> are usually disappointed because their AFib is different than their cousin's AFib. And so, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time getting to know each other, understanding their past medical history, looking at exams like echocardiograms, which are ultrasounds of the heart, um, uh, different types of studies that tell me more about the anatomy and the function of the heart that help guide, you know, what treatments might be more successful for some patients and not other patients. Here we go. I'll give you this last one, Dr. Kevin. Here it is. Uh, atrial, myth or fact, atrial fibrillation only affects seniors. Uh, definitely a myth. Definitely a myth. So very true that uh, elderly uh, and even just older uh, adults are at a higher risk of having AFib. If you look at uh, folks over 90, okay, it's still a pretty good uh, portion of, of people that we take care of in cardiology clinics. People over 90, about one in 10 have AFib. So really common, right? Uh, look around the room at lunch and, and someone's gonna have AFib. Uh, but uh, if you're over 65, the rate is somewhere around one in 20, okay? So th there is a, a, a gradual and kind of an exponential increase in the rate of AFib as you move on in the decades, so very age dependent. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Gami. So there you have it, everybody. Miss versus facts, y'all. So we have about five minutes left. And so at the beginning, we talked about the chief complaint when somebody comes to your office. What we do at the end when somebody leaves our office, we call it the assessment and plan. And that's when we render them a diagnosis. We render them a treatment plan. And of course, most importantly, we schedule that follow-up. So Dr. Gami, let's let's give, let's bring it on home, my friend. Give us a few take-home points for people that have been listening to the show, to this episode, All Things AFib. What's, what should they take away? Why is it important for them to know about AFib, in your opinion? Okay, absolutely. So, and this is great because this is how I end my conversation with Love patients it. as well. Perfect. So, we go back and we kind of, after the long discussion, we come around and, and start again at the Man, time. Brother. Why is AFib important? And I, this is what you need to impress upon 
uh, people and what I'd like you know your audience to know. Number one, it's important because of symptoms. Number two, it's important because of its association with an increased risk of stroke. And number three, it's important because of its potential relationship to heart failure or underlying structural problems with the heart. But what I, what I try to impress upon my patients is that that's it. Those are the three things. Sometimes they come in with a lot more. You know, is it going to make me die? Is it going to make me have a heart attack? Um, it's going to do a host of other things that, you know, that maybe they can't even put their finger on, but they're just anxious and worried about the term AFib. So when we break it down at the end of the visit, the assessment and plan is three things. What do we do about your symptoms? Let's compartmentalize that. What do we do about stroke prevention? That's got its own box. And what do we do to make sure that underlying structural problems with the heart are not an issue? If we deal with each box independent of each other, I feel like people really have a good understanding of what our goals are and they feel much more reassured that they're not dealing with some some hard to grasp kind of monster and, and, and killer called AFib. They really get it, that this is manageable in three distinct ways and uh, and we just focus on those. I appreciate you, Dr. Gami. And before we get into my final thoughts, let me hit you with a section here that we call Listener content healthy. Oh, yeah. So here it is. Listener <laughs> content healthy. Oh, yeah. Now, I don't have a specific one today, but here's my ploy for you out there. Um, if you have any health goals or any health success that you've had, please share them with me. I would love to share them with my followers, with other people, because again, your story may be a catalyst for someone who wants to hear it. So here's my final thoughts AFib remains a significant cause of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And additionally, it represents a significant marker for major consequences in public health and on healthcare delivery systems we rely on. If you are concerned that you are at risk for AFib, then please talk with your doctor. He or she will explain the diagnosis, talk about the condition, and check to see if you have any risk factors that can be treated. As physicians, we're going to continue to look at more efficient ways of delivering care for patients with AFib that leads to reduction in costly hospitalizations and disease burden, while at the same time focusing our efforts and doubling down on improved prevention strategies to eliminate or minimize the risk factors that lead to this condition in the first place. I want, to keep in, I want you to keep in mind that you have a role to play in this too. Those essential lifestyle choices that you can make on a daily basis can be important and foundational in your ability to prevent atrial fibrillation. So when it comes to getting to the heart of AFib, it also really speaks volumes about the importance of getting to the heart of your own personal health. I wanna thank my guest today, Dr. Apoor Gami, MD, board certified cardiac electrophysiologist at Midwest Cardiovascular Institute. Dr. Gami, love it, brother. Hey, I had a lot of fun. Uh, education's uh, basically essential to everything we do. And I, I think this is such a great venue. I had a lot of fun, Dr. Gami. Oh my Gami. gosh, well thank, you. You, well, thank you, Dr. Gami. My pleasure and everything. You've been listening to and watching Health 360 with Dr. G, a Healthy Driven Podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and vi video production specialist is Mike Paskey. Copyright 2021, Edward Elmer's Health. All rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health360podcast.com and follow me across all social media at health360, W. Dr. G. This is Dr. G signing off. And until next time, peace out.